who comes from the bridal chamber? It is Azrael, the angel of death. Falaba After the dreadful scene that had taken place at the castle, Lucy was transported to her own chamber, where she remained for some time in a state of absolute stupor. Yet afterwards, in the course of the ensuing day, she seemed to have recovered, not merely her spirits and resolution, but a sort of flighty levity, that was foreign to her character and situation, and which was at times checkered by fits of deep silence and melancholy and of capricious pettishness. Lady Ashton became much alarmed and consulted the family physicians. But as her pulse indicated no change, they could only say that the disease was on the spirits, and recommended gentle exercise and amusement. Miss Ashton never alluded to what had passed in the stateroom. It seemed doubtful even if she was conscious of it, for she was often observed to raise her hands to her neck, as if in search of the ribbon that had been taken from it, and mutter, in surprise and discontent, when she could not find it, it was the link that bound me to life. Notwithstanding all these remarkable symptoms, Lady Ashton was too deeply pledged to delay her daughter's marriage even in her present state of health. It cost her much trouble to keep up the fair side of appearances towards Bucklaw. She was well aware that if he once saw any reluctance on her daughter's part, he would break off the treaty to her great personal shame and dishonor. She therefore resolved that, if Lucy continued passive, the marriage should take place upon the day that had been previously fixed, trusting that a change of place, of situation, and of character would operate a more speedy and effectual cure upon the unsettled spirits of her daughter than could be attained by the slow measures which the medical men recommended. Sir William Ashton's views of family aggrandizement, and his desire to strengthen himself against the measures of the Marquis of A, readily induced him to acquiesce in what he could not have perhaps resisted if willing to do so. As for the young men, Bucklaw and Colonel Ashton, they protested that, after what had happened, it would be most dishonorable to postpone for a single hour the time appointed for the marriage, as it would be generally ascribed to their being intimidated by the intrusive visit and threats of Ravenswood. Bucklaw would indeed have been incapable of such precipitation, had he been aware of the state of Miss Ashton's health, or rather of her mind. But custom, upon these occasions, permitted only brief and sparing intercourse between the bridegroom and the betrothed, a circumstance so well improved by Lady Ashton, that Bucklaw neither saw nor suspected the real state of the health and feelings of his unhappy bride. On the eve of the bridal day, Lucy appeared to have one of her fits of levity, and surveyed with a degree of girlish interest the various preparations of dress, etc., etc., which the different members of the family had prepared for the occasion. The morning dawned bright and cheerily. The bridal guests assembled in gallant troops from distant quarters. Not only the relations of Sir William Ashton and the still more dignified connections of his lady, together with the numerous kinsmen and allies of the bridegroom, were present upon this joyful ceremony, gallantly mounted, arrayed, and caparisoned, but almost every Presbyterian family of distinction within fifty miles made a point of attendance upon an occasion which was considered as giving a sort of triumph over the Marquis of A, in the person of his kinsman. Splendid refreshments awaited the guests on their arrival, and after these were finished, the cry was to horse. The bride was led forth betwixt her brother Henry and her mother. Her gaiety of the preceding day had given rise, place, to a deep shade of melancholy, which, however, did not misbecome an occasion so momentous. There was a light in her eyes and a color in her cheek which had not been kindled for many a day, and which, joined to her great beauty, and the splendor of her dress, occasioned her entrance to be greeted with an universal murmur of applause, in which even the ladies could not refrain from joining. While the cavalcade were getting to horse, Sir William Ashton, a man of peace and of form, censured his son Henry for having begirt himself with a military sort of preposterous length, belonging to his brother, Colonel Ashton. If you must have a weapon, he said, upon such a peaceful occasion, why did you not use the short poniard sent from Edinburgh on purpose? The boy vindicated himself by saying it was lost. You put it out of the way yourself, I suppose, said his father, out of ambition to wear that preposterous thing, which might have served Sir William Wallace. But never mind, get to horse now, and take care of your sister. The boy did so, 
and was placed in the center of the gallant train. At the time, he was too full of his own appearance, his sword, his laced cloak, his feathered hat, and his managed horse, to pay much regard to anything else, but he afterwards remembered to the hour of his death, that when the hand of his sister, by which she supported herself on the pillion behind him, touched his own, it felt as wet and cold as sepulchral marble. Glancing wide over hill and dale, the fair bridal procession at last reached the parish church, which they nearly filled, for, besides domestics, above a hundred gentlemen and ladies were present upon the occasion. The marriage ceremony was performed according to the rites of the Presbyterian persuasion, to which Bucklaw of late had judged it proper to conform. On the outside of the church, a liberal dole was distributed to the poor of the neighboring parishes, under the direction of Johnny Morthook, Mortchu, who had lately been promoted from his desolate quarters at the Hermitage to fill the more eligible situation of Sexton at the parish church of Ravenswood. Dame Gourlay, with two of her contemporaries, the same who assisted at Alice's late wake, seated apart upon a flat monument, or through stain, sate enviously comparing the shares which had been allotted to them and dividing the dole. Johnny Morthook, said Annie Winnie, might hey minded old Lang Syne, and thought of his old kimmers, for as bra as he is with his new black coat. I hey gotten but five herring instead of sacks, and this dis look like a good saxpennies, and I dare say this bit morsel of beef is an ounce lighter than ony that's been dealt round, and it's a bit o' the tenany hoff, ne'er by token that yours, Maggie, is out o' the back say. Mine, quoth she, mumbled the paralytic hag, mine is half banes, I trow. If grit folk gie poor bodies ony thing for coming to their weddings and burials, it so be something that wad do them good, I think. Their gifts, said Alcee Gourlay, are dealt for nay love of us, nor out of respect for whether we feed or starve. They wad gie us windstains for loaves, if it would serve their ain vanity, and yet they expect us to be as great few, as they see a it, as if they served us for true love and liking. And that's truly said, answered her companion. But, ace like Gourlay, Yuri the oldest o' us three, did ye ever see a mere grand bridal? I wouldna say that I have, answered the hag, but I think soon to see his bra burial. And that what please me is will, said Annie Winnie, for there's as large a dole, and folk are no obliged to gurn and laugh, and mac mergens, and wish joy to these helicat quality, that lord it our us like brute beasts. I like to pack the dead dole in my lap and rin our my old rhyme. My loaf in my lap, my penny in my purse, thou art ne'er the better, and I'm ne'er the worse. That's right, Annie, said the paralytic woman, God send us a green yule and a fat kirkyard. But I wad like to ken, lucky Gourlay, for Yuri the oldest and wisest among us, will go these revellers turn it will be to be strike it first? D.C. on Dandily Maiden, said Dame Gourlay, a glisten in white doubt in jewels, that they are lifting up on the white horse behind that harebrained colland in scarlet, white the lang sword at his side? But that's the bride, said her companion, her cold heart touched with some sort of compassion, that's the very bride herself. Eh, how? Say ye young, say ye bra, and say ye bonny, and is her time say ye short? I tell ye, said the sibyl, her winding sheet is up as high as her throat already, believe it while list. Her sand has but few grains to rin out, and they wonder, they've been well shaken. The leaves are withering fast on the trees, but she'll never see the Martinmas Wingar them dance in swirls like the fairy rings. You waited on her for a quarter, said the paralytic woman, and got TWA red pieces, or I am far beguiled? I, I, answered Elsie, with a bitter grin, and Sir William Ashton promised me a bonny red gown to the Budo that, a stake, and a chain, and a tar barrel, lass. What think he owed that for a propine, for being up early and down late for fourscore nights and mare why his dwining daughter? But he may keep it for his ain leddy, comers. I hae heard a suff, said Annie Winnie, as if Letty Ashton was nae canny body. D see her yonder, said Dame Gourlay, as she prances on her grey gilding out at the kirkyard. There's marrow utter devilry in that woman, as brave and fair-fashioned as she rides yonder, 
than in is the Scotchwitzes that ever flew by moonlight hour north Barrick Law. What's that ye say about witches, ye damned hags, said Johnny Morthook, Morchu, are ye casting your cantrips in the very kirkyard to mischieve the bride and bridegroom? Get out haim, for if I tack my sipple to ye, I'll gar ye find the road faster than ye wad like. Hag, sirs, answered Alsi Gorlay, how bra are we why our new black coat and our wheel pothered head, as if we had never ken hunger nor thirst ourselves. And we'll be screwing up our bit fiddle, doubtless, in the ha the night, among the other elbow jiggers for miles round. Let's see if the pin's hawed, Johnny, that's a, lad. I take he a to witness, good people, said Morhush, that she threatens me why mischief, and forspeaks me. If only thing but good happens to me or my fiddle this night, I'll make it the blackest night's job she ever stirred in. I'll hay her before presbytery and synod, I'm half a minister missile, now that I'm a beadrill in an inhabited parish. Although the mutual hatred betwixt these hags and the rest of mankind had steeled their hearts against all impressions of festivity, this was by no means the case with the multitude at large. The splendor of the bridal retinue, the gay dresses, the spirited horses, the blithesome appearance of the handsome women and gallant gentlemen assembled upon the occasion, had the usual effect upon the minds of the populace. The repeated shouts of Ashton and Bucklaw forever, the discharge of pistols, guns, and musk-tunes, to give what was called the bridal shot, evinced the interest the people took in the occasion of the cavalcade, as they accompanied it upon their return to the castle. If there was here and there an elder peasant or his wife who sneered at the pomp of the upstart family, and remembered the days of the long-descended Ravenswoods, even they, attracted by the plentiful cheer which the castle that day afforded to rich and poor, held their way thither, and acknowledged, notwithstanding their prejudices, the influence of L.M. Fitri and O.L. Undyne. Thus accompanied with the attendants both of rich and poor, Lucy returned to her father's house. Bucklaw used his privilege of riding next to the bride, but, new to such a situation, rather endeavored to attract attention by the display of his person and horsemanship than by any attempt to address her in private. They reached the castle in safety, amid a thousand joyous acclamations. It is well known that the weddings of ancient days were celebrated with a festive publicity rejected by the delicacy of modern times. The marriage guests, on the present occasion, were regaled with a banquet of unbounded profusion, the relics of which, after the domestics had feasted in their turn, were distributed among the shouting crowd, with as many barrels of ale as made the hilarity without correspond to that within the castle. The gentlemen, according to the fashion of the times, indulged, for the most part, in deep draughts of the richest wines, while the ladies, prepared for the ball which always closed a bridal entertainment, impatiently expected their arrival in the state gallery. At length the social party broke up at a late hour, and the gentlemen crowded into the saloon, where, enlivened by wine and the joyful occasion, they laid aside their swords and handed their impatient partners to the floor. The music already rung from the gallery, along the fretted roof of the ancient state apartment. According to strict etiquette, the bride ought to have opened the ball, but Lady Ashton, making an apology on account of her daughter's health, offered her own hand to Bucklaw as substitute for her daughter's. But as Lady Ashton raised her head gracefully, expecting the strain at which she was to begin the dance, she was so much struck by an unexpected alteration in the ornaments of the apartment that she was surprised into an exclamation, who has dared to change the pictures? All looked up, and those who knew the usual state of the apartment observed, with surprise, that the picture of Sir William Ashton's father was removed from its place, and in its stead that of old Sir Mullis Ravenswood seemed to frown wrath and vengeance upon the party assembled below. The exchange must have been made while the apartments were empty, but had not been observed until the torches and lights in the sconces were kindled for the ball. The haughty and heated spirits of the gentlemen led them to demand an immediate inquiry into the cause of what they deemed an affront to their host and to themselves, but Lady Ashton, recovering herself, passed it over as the freak of a crazy wench who was maintained about the castle, and whose susceptible imagination had been observed to be much affected by the stories which Dame Gourlay delighted to tell concerning the former family, so Lady Ashton named the Ravenswoods. The obnoxious picture was immediately removed, and the ball was opened by Lady Ashton, with a grace and dignity which supplied the charms of youth, 
and almost verified the extravagant encomiums of the elder part of the company, who extolled her performance as far exceeding the dancing of the rising generation. When Lady Ashton sat down, she was not surprised to find that her daughter had left the apartment, and she herself followed, eager to obviate any impression which might have been made upon her nerves by an incident so likely to affect them as the mysterious transposition of the portraits. Apparently she found her apprehensions groundless, for she returned in about an hour, and whispered the bridegroom, who extricated himself from the dancers, and vanished from the apartment. The instruments now played their loudest strains, the dancers pursued their exercise with all the enthusiasm inspired by youth, mirth, and high spirits, when a cry was heard so shrill and piercing as at once to arrest the dance and the music. All stood motionless, but when the yell was again repeated, Colonel Ashton snatched a torch from the sconce, and demanding the key of the bridal chamber from Henry, to whom, as bridesman, it had been entrusted, rushed thither, followed by Sir William Ashton and Lady Ashton, and one or two others, near relations of the family. The bridal guests waited their return in stupefied amazement. Arrived at the door of the apartment, Colonel Ashton knocked and called, but received no answer except stifled groans. He hesitated no longer to open the door of the apartment, in which he found opposition from something which lay against it. When he had succeeded in opening it, the body of the bridegroom was found lying on the threshold of the bridal chamber, and all around was flooded with blood. A cry of surprise and horror was raised by all present, and the company, excited by this new alarm, began to rush tumultuously towards the sleeping apartment. Colonel Ashton, first whispering to his mother, search for her, she has murdered him, drew his sword, planted himself in the passage, and declared he would suffer no man to pass excepting the clergyman and a medical person present. By their assistance, Bucklaw, who still breathed, was raised from the ground and transported to another apartment, where his friends, full of suspicion and murmuring, assembled round him to learn the opinion of the surgeon. In the meanwhile, Lady Ashton, her husband, and their assistants in vain sought Lucy in the bridal bed and in the chamber. There was no private passage from the room, and they began to think that she must have thrown herself from the window, when one of the company, holding his torch lower than the rest, discovered something white in the corner of the great old-fashioned chimney of the apartment. Here they found the unfortunate girl seated, or rather couched like a hare upon its form, her headgear disheveled, her nightclothes torn and dabbled with blood, her eyes glazed, and her features convulsed into a wild paroxysm of insanity. When she saw herself discovered, she gibbered, made mouths, and pointed at them with her bloody fingers, with the frantic gestures of an exulting demoniac. Female assistance was now hastily summoned, the unhappy bride was overpowered, not without the use of some force. As they carried her over the threshold, she looked down and uttered the only articulate words that she had yet spoken, saying, with a sort of grinning exultation, so, you have ta'en up your bonny bridegroom? She was, by the shuddering assistance, conveyed to another and more retired apartment, where she was secured as her situation required, and closely watched. The unutterable agony of the parents, the horror and confusion of all who were in the castle, the fury of contending passions between the friends of the different parties, passions augmented by previous intemperance, surpassed description. The surgeon was the first who obtained something like a patient hearing. He pronounced that the wound of Bucklaw, though severe and dangerous, was by no means fatal, but might readily be rendered so by disturbance and hasty removal. This silenced the numerous party of Bucklaw's friends, who had previously insisted that he should, at all rates, be transported from the castle to the nearest of their houses. They still demanded, however, that, in consideration of what had happened, four of their number should remain to watch over the sick bed of their friend, and that a suitable number of their domestics, well armed, should also remain in the castle. This condition being acceded to on the part of Colonel Ashton and his father, the rest of the bridegroom's friends left the castle, notwithstanding the hour and the darkness of the night. The cares of the medical man were next employed in behalf of Miss Ashton, whom he pronounced to be in a very dangerous state. Farther medical assistance was immediately summoned. All night she remained delirious. On the morning, she fell into a state of absolute insensibility. The next evening, the physician said, would be the crisis of her malady. It proved so 
for although she awoke from her trance with some appearance of calmness, and suffered her nightclothes to be changed, or put in order, yet so soon as she put her hand to her neck, as if to search for the for the fatal blue ribbon, a tide of recollection seemed to rush upon her, which her mind and body were alike incapable of bearing. Convulsion followed convulsion, till they closed in death, without her being able to utter a word explanatory of the fatal scene. The provincial judge of the district arrived the day after the young lady had expired, and executed, though with all possible delicacy to the afflicted family, the painful duty of inquiring into this fatal transaction. But there occurred nothing to explain the general hypothesis that the bride, in a sudden fit of insanity, had stabbed the bridegroom at the threshold of the apartment. The fatal weapon was found in the chamber smeared with blood. It was the same poniard which Henry should have worn on the wedding day, and the unhappy sister had probably contrived to secrete on the preceding evening, when it had been shown to her among other articles of preparation for the wedding. The friends of Bucklaw expected that on his recovery he would throw some light upon this dark story, and eagerly pressed him with inquiries, which for some time he evaded under pretext of weakness. When, however, he had been transported to his own house, and was considered in a state of convalescence, he assembled those persons, both male and female, who had considered themselves as entitled to press him on this subject, and returned them thanks for the interest they had exhibited in his behalf, and their offers of adherence and support. I wish you all, he said, my friends, to understand, however, that I have neither story to tell nor injuries to avenge. If a lady shall question me henceforward upon the incident of that unhappy night, I shall remain silent, and in future consider her as one who has shown herself desirous to break off her friendship with me, in a word, I will never speak to her again. But if a gentleman shall ask me the same question, I shall regard the incivility as equivalent to an invitation to meet him in the Duke's walk, and I expect that he will rule himself accordingly. A declaration so decisive admitted no commentary, and it was soon after seen that Bucklaw had arisen from the bed of sickness a sadder and a wiser man than he had hitherto shown himself. He dismissed Cragenjil from his society, but not without such a provision as, if well employed, might secure him against indigence and against temptation. Bucklaw afterwards went abroad, and never returned to Scotland, nor was he known ever to hint at the circumstances attending his fatal marriage. By many readers this may be deemed overstrained, romantic, and composed by the wild imagination of an author desirous of gratifying the popular appetite for the horrible, but those who are read in the private family history of Scotland during the period in which the scene is laid, will readily discover, through the disguise of borrowed names and added incidents, the leading particulars of an hour true tale.